five of our series called The Summer on the Mount. And uh, it's kind of, you can tell by the, the name of this, we're spending the summer in the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably Jesus' most famous of, of his sermons, of, of his teachings, uh, all throughout the Bible. The, the Sermon on the Mount is not a collection of, of teachings and talks. It is one comprehensive, cohesive sermon that Jesus gives in front of a crowd of potentially thousands of people. And in it, if you've read it before or you've just been tracking along through the series, there are so many incredible, profound things to pull out of this. Things to be inspired by, encouraged by, challenged by, and everything in between. And so we have been enjoying this. We're in week five now, which is crazy how fast we've been moving through this. And I'm going to read to you guys from Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20. And we're just picking up from where we left off last week. Last week, we ended in verse 16. And we were talking about being salt and light. And I talked a lot about salt last week. I probably don't want to talk about it for a long time, ever again. But... We learned through this that our, our faith, what did Jesus mean by you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world? What Jesus meant was that by being the salt, it means that your faith adds value everywhere you go. And being the light, it means that your faith must be visible everywhere you go. So we add value and we're, our faith is visible. And we're not striving to have a faith that is visible so that people see us and honor and glorify us, but that through us they see and honor and glorify Jesus. Right? So that they will see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. So Matthew 5, 17, though, Jesus is, uh, pat, like his teaching here takes a bit of a, a left turn. Coming out of the Beatitudes, coming out of uh, the salt and light passage. And so I want to read to you guys from this. Verse 17, Jesus says this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear... Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, what in the world do you do with a passage like that? And so let's pray before we preach so that the Holy Spirit can help me explain this. And then uh, we'll ask that the Holy Spirit would, would uh, preach uniquely to each of us. God, we just thank you for this morning. Holy Spirit, we invite you to use this word. Speak through me, God, to each and every heart. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would preach uniquely. Lord, what, what exactly do we need to hear individually in this moment and collectively as your body? Holy Spirit, we ask that you would work in us, convict us, and help us to become more like Jesus. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said together. Amen. Amen. So what I want to do today is I want to attempt to bring clarity to one of the possibly most confusing passages in all of the Bible. These, these four verses have confused and confounded people for 2,000 years. And so much so that different factions in the church, different denominations have literally ar like arisen from this passage of scripture. People have gone different directions because there's not agreement at times as to what in the world is Jesus talking about here. This, this passage is loaded with stuff. I want to read this to you from Jonathan T. Pennington. He wrote a book called The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing that I'm reading through as I progress through the Sermon on the Mount. And he said the compactness of this passage is at once its power and its difficulty. By virtue of its pithy, contrastive statements, we get uh, a large-scale snapshot of the issue. But its brevity and super-concentrated collection of weighty terms and ideas mean that every sentence is a spark that sets off a fire in a different direction. Like good poetry, this short passage is thick with meaning and in need of deep reflection. So we want to dive deep into that meaning today, and I want to kind of reflect as we go through this passage today and learn a little bit about what Jesus is getting at. Now, I want to kind of set this up as a disclaimer, if you guys will allow me. Anytime that I preach, I take the passage and I build out the message, and I kind of have in mind an idea of what I want everyone to leave feeling based on that message. So, for example, uh, there's some sermons that I put together, and after taking the passage and building out the message... I have, you know, concluded that I think, I think everyone's going to leave today feeling 
encouraged. Right? That's like a main thing. Like sometimes I preach, I'm like, this message is going to encourage people today. So they came in, their head was hanging low, their soul was feeling downcast. My prayer over that word is, Holy Spirit, would you lift their head and bring their soul back to life? I want people to leave it encouraged. There, there's other messages that I preach, and I feel like the main thing that I want people to feel is convicted. Right? Sometimes there's a message. You ever heard a sermon that just hit hard? Like the whole message, you're like, ouch. Like, I think the pastor knows what's happening in my life. Like, he's preaching that for me. That's not because I know your business. That's because the Holy Spirit knows your business, right? And so sometimes I'm like, I want people to leave convicted. Not condemned. Convicted. Condemnation comes from the enemy. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Condemnation will make you run from God. Conviction will make you run toward God. It is a gift of the Spirit. And sometimes the Scripture, it cuts you, Right? But like a good doctor, it does not cut to harm, it cuts to heal. So you allow the scripture, right? So there's some weeks I'm like, I want you to feel convicted, and I know it ahead of time. Like, I know I'm going to preach a word that's going to convict. Other times, I preach, and I pray that this this sermon would be motivated. Like, I want people to feel motivated. You know, and those are those messages, like being the salt and light of the the world. Last week was a motivated kind of message. I wanted you to leave here with this in mind, that how do I go to my home, my workspace, my school, any sphere of influence that God has given me, and how can I be salt to add value everywhere I go, and how can I bring the light of Christ everywhere that I go? I want people to feel motivated, right? I'm not, not that like I'm the only one in full-time ministry, but you as a believer, you're in full-time ministry as well. We're ministers of the gospel. Now, here's where today's a little bit different. Sure, I want you to feel, you know, uh, all these various things that I talked about, but today, the, the main thing that I've been praying And it's a little different for me, I'll be honest with you, and you'll see as I break down this passage, is the thing I want you to feel today as you leave is educated. Now, not in the social media passive-aggressive sense, like educate yourself, you know? And if you say that on social media, stop it, okay? It's the most self-righteous thing someone can say. But I want you to feel educated. I want us to learn today. So we're going to take a theological deep dive. We're going to pour some theological cement in the foundation of our faith, because I think there's too many believers that know what they believe, they don't know why they believe it. So when somebody, when somebody challenges and asks the question, why, if you don't know why, doubt begins to creep in. And I watch people's faith begin to crack and then eventually crumble because they don't know why they believe what they believe. So sometimes we just got to learn some stuff. Is that okay? We're going to learn a little bit today. And I'm going to try to not make this like this lecture that you're like falling asleep. So don't, don't do that. I got, I got some jokes. Okay, we'll talk. We'll have some fun. Um, but we'll, so I want you guys to track with me uh, today. And I'm, this is the most ADD thing ever, I'm so sorry, but JR, is it your 30th birthday today? I didn't know you were here. Happy birthday, JR. I thought you were out of town. 30, let's go, join the club. Are your knees feeling a little sore? Yeah, okay. That's where it starts. Um, now, here, let me jump into this now. The, the reason that what Jesus said in Matthew 5 is confusing for people is as he's talking about the law, is that the New Testament and the New Testament writers spend an extraordinary amount of time Trying to show us and build the case that we are no longer bound to or under the law. If you read the whole New Testament, it's like we're, we're not bound to the law. We're not under the law. We're in a new covenant. This is a covenant of grace. And, and um, like even Paul, one of the clearest passages on this comes from Romans chapter 10, verse 4. And it says this, for, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, would you agree that's pretty clear cut and dry? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. He's saying, you want to become righteous? You need Christ, not the law. Then in Galatians. uh, Galatians is one of the funniest books of the Bible, I think, because you can tell that Paul is writing and he's frustrated. He's really frustrated at the Galatian church. He loves them, but he's mad at them. It's kind of like me with my kids, right? I love my kids, but I'm frustrated half the time. Okay, so he's frustrated at them. And one of the main ways this is playing out is kind of an awkward scenario. The Galatian believers, the the converts that had a Jewish background, they were coming to the church, converting to Christianity. And then there were Gentile converts, people that didn't have a a Jewish background or tradition, don't know anything about Judaism. They're now being converted and joining the church as well. But something interesting was happening. The Jewish converts were trying to make the Gentile converts get circumcised so they could be part of their church. They're like, hey, if you want to be part of this church, you've got to get Circumcised. This was the symbol of the covenant before the Jews and, and God. Now, how many of you would believe there probably weren't a lot of guys in that church, right? Not a lot of Gentile men in, in that church. And so Paul comes in and, and he goes, guys, what are we doing here, right? First of all, like, there's no way the church is ever going to grow if we're trying to put this on people. 
Right? Imagine walking into the church and this guy's like, man, I love this church. Like, how do I join it? They're like, why don't we sit down for a second? Let's all talk about this for a minute, right? And so Paul comes to them and he's frustrated. Look what he says in Galatians 3 verse 1. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Other translations say, has somebody put a spell on you? Our modern translation of this would be, have you lost your minds? Have you lost your minds? That, that everything that I came and taught you, you're not going to turn it into this. And then in, in verse 2, he says, did you, did you receive the Spirit? So did you receive salvation in, in the Spirit by works of the law? Or by believing what you heard? This is a, a rhetorical question. He's saying, you, you received the Spirit of salvation... Because of the gospel message that I preached to you, not because of the law. Are you so foolish that after beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Then he goes on in verse 23 and he says, we were held in custody under the law. Locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law became our guardian to lead us to Christ. Guys, the law was always meant to point to Jesus. That we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So Paul is building this case with this really awkward scenario that they found themselves in. He's like, guys, we are completely missing the point here. You are saved not by works of the law and going back to the law in which you've been brought out of, but we are saved by faith through grace alone. Right? So you need the grace of God through faith alone. So Paul gives these very clear, very strong words. And then we go back to Matthew 5 and we read Jesus' words, and it seems to contradict each other. So you go back to Jesus and talk about the law. Jesus goes, hey, don't, don't think for a second that I've come to abolish the law and the commandments. And he takes it a step further. He says, whoever sets the, the law aside does not live according and does not live according to its commands are, go, are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's like, I didn't come to abolish this. And honestly, if you don't live according to it, you're not getting in to the kingdom, either now in the present nor for eternity. And so over the centuries, and you might be sitting here confused about this as well. Now, over the centuries, this has brought a lot of confusion and division. And there's been some different responses. One of those responses has been kind of what the Galatians did, where people have created this hybrid Christianity-Judaism religion, where they look to Christ for salvation, but then they still attempt to follow the Old Testament laws to keep themselves righteous and justified before him. Right? So there's kind of this hybrid thing that they put together, which is a a very confused version of Christianity because it says something like this. I trust Christ for my salvation, sort of. But I kind of trust him. But then I'm going to do all these other things to just like make sure, just in case, like we're not misunderstanding what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 5. Another theory is that some people I read this week actually think that Matthew made this up. That Jesus never even said this. And Matthew, he was a tax collector. You can't trust those guys anyway. He just made this up. He just put it in for whatever reason. Others conclude that Jesus just didn't really mean it. Like maybe Jesus is kind of like my wife, where sometimes what she says is not exactly what she means. Any married men in the house? Okay. If you're going to get married at some point, you need to understand that. What she says is not always what she means. So maybe, maybe that's what Jesus is doing here. Um, there was a well-known second century heretic by the name of Marcion. And Marcion, he dogmatically believed and he taught that Jesus came to dismantle the law and the prophets. Like he's, this is what he believes. Like, no, Jesus came to destroy this. So much so that Marcion rewrote the New Testament. And in his rewriting of the New Testament, he got rid of every reference to the Old Testament. Anytime they quoted it or mentioned it, just wiped it out. It's like, no, it doesn't exist. Rewrote it. And then when he got to this part of the Sermon on the Mount, he actually didn't take it out. He changed it. And it said, it read like this. I have not, I have come not to fulfill the law and the prophets, but to abolish them. And he kind of developed this cult following, you know, of people that just were like, oh, like, I love this version. This is so much better. I, I had the thought this week that Marcion would have made a great modern day TikTok theologian. To get theology from TikTok, like, you're in trouble. Let's just start there for a second. But I watch this happening all the time. People taking, they sound smart. They put a little bit of music behind it so it sounds believable. And they're not just giving an interpretation of scripture. They are completely changing and thwarting scripture to fit their agenda. And this is what Marcion does. So for us today, I think rather than rewriting Jesus' words, I think a better choice would be to try to better understand his words. So let's dive deep for a moment. What in the world is Jesus talking about? So I want to start by asking, what did Jesus mean by the law and the prophets? He said, I, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. And if you guys want to put this slide up on the screen, this will show us what this looks like. So what did he mean by the law? 
The law is the Pentateuch. Okay, this is the first five books of the Bible. Does anybody know them? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Thank you, Kids Church, right? We remember all this. Like, you got songs for this stuff. These first five books of the Bible, this is where we find the Ten Commandments. It's where we find the 613 laws within the Old Covenant. So if you want to abide by the laws of the Old Covenant, you got 613 you got to keep up with. I can't even get parking right in this city, so I have no hope in following these laws, right? 613 of them, the first five books, the story of Israel, the covenant with Abraham, the exodus out of Egypt, all of this is wrapped in these first five books. Then you have the prophets. It's actually really significant that Jesus didn't just say the law, but he also said, and the prophets. Because what this adds in is everything believed to be, uh, the rest of Jewish scripture, everything to believe, believed or spoken by the prophets. Everything they wrote about, the historic, poetic, and prophetic. So Jesus then pulls in all of the Old Testament writings. I love the way John Stott puts this really clearly and simply. He just said, the law was a comprehensive term for the total divine revelation of the Old Testament. So Jesus essentially is saying, I did not come to abolish the Old Testament, but I came to fulfill it. I've not come to wipe it away, but to uphold it. Guys, Jesus approved of the law and the prophets. Sometimes people like to pit Jesus against the Old Testament. Like the Old Testament was the beta version, and then here comes Jesus, a brand new operating system. He's like, hey, I actually got this right this time. God was just grumpy and in a bad mood in the Old Testament, had a bunch of disobedient kids, was a really strict dad. Let me show you how cool he is now, you know? And that's not what it is. That's a total misunderstanding of what this looks like from the Old to the New Covenant. Jesus loved the scriptures. He abided by them. And all through the gospel, we see Jesus holding scripture in high regard. Why do I hold scripture in high regard and why do I often tell you that you should do the same? It's because Jesus held scripture in high regard. Now his scripture 2,000 years ago was the Old Testament, but he held it to high esteem and constantly Jesus was quoting. If you read through the gospels, Jesus points back to the Old Testament over and over and over again, quoting the Old Testament scriptures. One of his favorite sayings in conversations and debates with the religious leaders was go and learn what this scripture means, which would have been just such a slight to them. Like these are the smartest men of the day. And he'd be like, I want you to go back and actually learn what this really means. But he's always pointing people back. What do the scriptures tell you? Go and learn what this means. And then you have the famous showdown of Jesus in the wilderness with the devil. I think I talked about this about four weeks ago. So as a recap, Jesus has been baptized. He goes into the wilderness led by the spirit, fast for 40 days. And the devil comes to tempt him in person. And he tempts him three times. And, and here's what's fascinating about how the devil tempts. And, and I mentioned this, so this is, again, just a little bit of a refresher for most of you guys ever here. Now, the Bible tells us that the devil is the father of lies. That he has no truth in him. That when he lies, he speaks his native language. What's wild to me is that the devil comes to Jesus, and he also does this in Genesis in the garden. The devil comes to him, and he quotes God. He quotes scripture. So something you have to understand is that the enemy knows scripture better than you do. And he knows it better than I do. However, to quote scripture accurately would be would mean that you are speaking the truth. So he cannot quote scripture accurately. He always quotes it with a twist or some kind of lie hidden underneath. So he does it to Eve in the garden. He does it to Jesus in the wilderness. So he comes in. He twists the scripture. He's trying to get Jesus to get off of the call that God has placed on his life for this mission. And I love what Jesus does. He doesn't respond with his own one-liners or counter arguments, but he responds with the word of God. He says, it is written. It is written. I learned this past week that this is a, a Greek word, a phrase. And the phrase is grapho. Okay, I'm probably butchering that, but grapho. And, and here's what I found about this word, that this is written in the perfect tense, which means this, it isn't past or present or future, but it's all three of them at the same time. So Jesus is saying it was written, it is written, and it will always be written. Jesus is showing us the foundation of standing on the word of God and that God's word stands eternal. He's got an eternal word. Now we jump into Matthew 5, verse 18. He says, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So we're seeing that Jesus upholds the law and the prophets. He doesn't get rid of it. And then I got to be honest, Jesus' teaching as he progresses in verse 19 and 20 gets even a little bit tougher to swallow. So let's jump into verse 19 and 20. Then he keeps going. He says, therefore, 
Anyone who sets aside one of the least commands and teaches others accordingly, remember this, 613 of these commands. If you set aside the least of them, then you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, this last verse creates some major issues. I think especially for the first century believers. So I think about their context. We don't really know always like what a Pharisee is, right? Unless you've really, you know, dived in and studied this stuff for yourself. So um, unless your righteousness is greater than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Let me give you a little bit of background on the Pharisees. The, the Pharisees, they not only made it their life mission to follow the entire law. Like this was, this was their goal. We're going to follow all 613 commands. They would go way above and beyond to put in some measures that would ensure that they wouldn't even come close to breaking the law. So for them, it wasn't enough to just not break the law. They would live in a way that it made it almost impossible for them to break the law. The, the first thing that popped in my mind was thinking about the way that my grandparents drove their car. Um, anybody have grandma or grandpa that drive really slow? Anybody? Which is probably good for our health, right? They were a hazard on the road to anyone that was out there. But then what they would do is they would drive, and, and they didn't want to get a speeding ticket because they grew up in the post-World War I Great Depression era where everything was like thrifty and like save your money. So they didn't want to get a ticket. So for them, it wasn't enough to, to simply just drive the speed limit. They had to drive 15 miles per hour under the speed limit. Right, we're not getting a ticket. I don't even want to get close to getting pulled over. This is kind of how the Pharisees lived their life. It wasn't enough to just obey the law. They had to take extra measures to avoid disobeying it at all costs. One, one example of this is uh, Pharisees, when they went out in public, many of them would bow their head as low as they could when they were walking around so that they would not lust if they saw a woman. There was a sect of these Pharisees called the Bleeding Pharisees. They were so committed to this as they had their head down, they were famous for running straight into walls. Like that's how committed. Like they couldn't even see what was directly in front of them. So you would see this Pharisee with his head down, he's bleeding, and you'd just be like, wow, what a man of God that is. Look at all that blood, right? So this was their level of commitment. Then you, you think about the Sabbath. This was the, the day of rest that God gave to his people. And so on the Sabbath, you weren't supposed to work. You weren't even supposed to carry burdens on the Sabbath. So the scribes sit down, they begin to try to ask themselves, well, what, what constitutes work? How do, how do we define this? And what, like how heavy of a burden are we allowed to carry? So they determined this, that not only could you not work on the Sabbath, but the heaviest thing you were allowed to lift was a dried fig. That was the heaviest object you could lift on the Sabbath. And this is how these guys lived their life. And I imagine one of these Pharisees, their little kid is like wanting to be picked up on the Sabbath. Like, hold me, Dad. And he's like, not right now. Like, go find your mom. Like, you, this isn't going to work. And, and so uh, William Barclay says this. He says, the scribes were the men who interpreted the rules and regulations the Pharisees, who na whose name means separated ones, were the men who had separated themselves from all the ordinary activities of life to keep these rules and regulations. So this is what the first century listeners would have had in mind. These guys who, who don't just try to live holy, but they live a, an extraordinarily strange life in their efforts to live a holy life. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness goes way past theirs, you're not getting into the kingdom. And so they're like looking at Jesus like, what in the world are you even talking about? Like, how, how is this possible? No one can, can live up to this standard. I heard a pastor say it like this one time. He said if this was in our modern context, this would be kind of like Jesus saying to you, hey, in order to get into the kingdom of heaven, you have to be really fast. You got to be really fast. The question that you would ask next is probably, you know, well, how fast do I need to be, Jesus? Well, and he'd say something like, um, you ever heard of Usain Bolt? You'd be like, yeah, the uh, Olympic champion, the fastest man to, to ever live. And you'd be like, yeah, that guy, um, he's way too slow. Yeah, he, that guy, he's way too slow to get in. You gotta be fast in the kingdom, but you gotta be faster than you say. Well, what, what's our response to that? Jesus, that's not possible. This is the best humanity has to offer. And if he can't get in, then how in the world do I get in? Right, Jesus begins to build this standard. And this is what the, fair, this is what the context would have been. In the first century. If they can't get in, then who the heck can? No one can do this. And that, my friends, is the whole point. 
This is the point that Jesus is trying to make. He's not trying to set some absurd standard that we, that we strive the rest of our lives to live up to. He wants you to have this moment of realization that you cannot live according to the standard of righteousness before God. It is not possible. And if you want to live according to the law, you have to follow all of the law. But guess what? You can't do it. So it leaves us in a little bit of a predicament. And this is exactly what opens the door for the story of the gospel. This moment of realizing that I don't have it in and of myself. I am in need of someone else. And that's what opens the door for the gospel. So now let's backtrack to verse 16. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish, but I came to fulfill. What does Jesus mean by fulfilling the law and the prophets? Well, three quick things. The first thing is this, that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. This is how we know that Jesus is the Christ. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Christ was not Jesus' last name. He didn't wear Christ on the back of his jersey, you know, or he wasn't ever at like a restaurant waiting to be sat. And the hostess is like, um, Christ, party of 13, you know, your table's ready. That, that wasn't how it was for him, right? It's a horrible pastor joke. So it, Christ, was, Christ was a title. Okay, at least I can call it out when I know it's word, bad. It's a title. Christ is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. So the Messiah was the one all through the, the Old Testament who's talked about and prophesied about. And he was the one who would come and redeem the people of God. And not just the people of Israel, but there would be a door that opened to the Gentile, to everyone else on the outside looking in. Jesus shows up and he fulfills 360 Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Matthew in particular, I mean, guys, he goes to great lengths throughout his gospel. To show us that Jesus is the fulfillment. I mean, he will pause in the narrative to say, and this happened to fulfill what was said over here. As you read through Matthew again, like you'll notice this is everywhere in his gospel. This is like the main theme of Matthew. He, he's the one. There's no question. He's the guy that we've been waiting for since the fall of Genesis. He's the one who's going to crush the head of the serpent. Matthew says it's him. And the entire Old Testament essentially is a narrative that points to Jesus. And when you see it that way, the scriptures come alive. Right? You don't look at Joseph and Moses and Hosea and Esther simply as stories of the, of the story of, of the people of God or some moral life that we need to aspire to. You see the foreshadowing of Christ in every single one of these people. You watch as Joseph forgives the unforgivable. What does Christ do for us? He forgives the unforgivable. You begin to see Christ in all of the Old Testament. So Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. He fulfills the, the prophecies. The second thing is this, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the moral law. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We, we just sang about this a few moments ago. We have a God who, who bleeds, a God who weeps, who understands who we are and where we come from. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So we are similar to Christ in that we are tempted, and he was as well, but we are different in that he did not succumb to the temptation. 1 Peter 2.22 says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Now, let's pour a little more theological concrete for a second. One of the things I'm, I'm watching happen, I see this on Twitter, I see this on, on TikTok, all over the place, is there are people calling themselves Christians who are now beginning to call into question whether or not Jesus lived a sinless life. And I bring this up because you have to understand this. All of our faith and what we believe about Christ begins to fall apart quickly if we do not believe the core doctrine that Christ lived a sinless life. I watched a TikTok video of a guy who called out Jesus saying Jesus was racist. And he was trying to show in scripture what that looked like. And I'm saying, guys, that is a slippery slope to get on the moment that you start looking at Christ as he was flawed like we were. Because he wasn't. So please understand. You're going to hear stuff online. Check what you see. Check what you read. Check what you hear. And I mean that from me as well. Be a Berean as it's called in the New Testament. Take what I tell you. Go open the Bible for yourself and see. Is, is Brandon telling me the truth? Don't ever have a single teacher that you look at. Like I just trust. Every, I want to be trustworthy. I do. But I want you to be somebody that says I'm going to study this for myself. We don't need Christians that just know what to think. We need you to know how to think. So you can combat lies when they show up. It's nonsense, honestly. So these, this is the core tenet of our faith. It's core to who Jesus is. And I'll show you this in a second. 
So Jesus perfectly keeps the commands of the law. And check this out. He lived the righteousness that surpassed the righteousness of the scribes and the teachers of the law. So we cannot do it, but Jesus did it. And then the last thing, number three, is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the atonement for sin. So he fulfilled prophecy, he lived the moral code, and he fulfills, he becomes the fulfillment for our atonement for sin. In the Old Testament, it states that the, the sacrifice, the penalty for sin, the wages of sin is death. And this took place, the atonement was made through animal sacrifice. Now this is kind of interesting to think about and look at. So you go all the way back to Exodus chapter 12. The wage of sin is death. In Exodus 12, it says that the lamb, it would be a lamb that was sacrificed for sins, and the lamb that was sacrificed was to be unblemished. Which meant this, you could not walk out to your field or your flock and go, look at like the old one, it's like 19 years old, it's laying down on its last leg, and be like, let's kill that one, right? No, that didn't work like that. Jesus, I want you to get the best one, and one that is without spot, without stain, unblemished. That's the one that will be sacrificed for sin. Now you fast forward to the New Testament. The Apostle Peter, who walked with Jesus, who shared his life with Jesus, who ultimately was crucified upside down, giving his life for Jesus. Never recanted, never took any of these things back, went to his grave, saying this is the truth of who he is. Peter writes these words. He says, you, talking about us, you were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish or defect. This is why the Bible calls him the Lamb of God. Why is it important that Jesus lived a sinless life? Because he becomes the Lamb without stain or spot, the unblemished Lamb of God. A sinful man, I could step in and say, look, I want to die for your sins. Like, let, let me do it for you. But I am not Christ. I have sin. Therefore, I'm not a suitable sacrifice to atone for your sin. Jesus living a perfect life, he becomes the sacrifice needed to atone for the sin of all mankind. Now Hebrews 10 takes this even further. And it says in verse 1 that the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make those perfect who draw near to worship. So he's saying these sacrifices that were being made in the Old Testament, they would, what we're going to find is that they would cover sin, but they would not remove sin. So he said, you, you would sin, take the lamb, sacrifice it, and then the next month, the next year, you're having to do it again. Over and over, year after year, having to pay the penalty for the sin. Then in verse 11, he says this, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins, but when this priest, everybody one time say this priest. When this priest, talking about Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Which I love this picture because you don't sit down until the work is completed. So he completes the work, sacrifice made, it's good once and for all, and he sits down at the right hand of God. Since, since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, Verse 14, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect. He has made perfect. I love this. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, be perfect as my Father is perfect. You're like, how do I do that? Right here. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Guys, all of the Old Testament sacrificial system points to Jesus. All of it. And it's in this believing in Christ as the fulfillment of our atonement that we look to him and we trust him alone for salvation. That's it. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the sinless literally became sin. He wore mine and he wore yours on that cross. He took the penalty of death that we deserve, and I love this phrase, that he gave Jesus what he did not deserve so that we could receive what we do not deserve. Jesus didn't deserve death. He didn't deserve the cross. But we also don't deserve grace, and we don't deserve mercy, but that's the scandalous nature of grace and of the gospel. Christ got what he didn't deserve so that we could receive what we do not deserve. 
So through all of this, what you begin to see is that Christ upholds the law and subsequently fulfills the law. He does it. He fulfills it. He completes it. And he says, this law that you couldn't obey, I will obey it for you. Let me obey it for you. Well, let me illustrate this like this. Have you ever been uh, guilty by association before? This happened to me um, in the seventh grade. I was in language, arts, and literature class, Miss Andrews. This was 2001. And we're sitting at this table. It's me and three other people. That's like the, the nature of the classroom set up. And we're taking this test, and I noticed that the other three people at the table are passing around this piece of paper, and they're sharing the answers with each other. My first thought was, how come nobody's passing that over here? But they weren't sharing it with me, okay? I'm taking the test. Our teacher looks up and notices what's happening. My entire table gets brought out into the hallway, and we are scolded. We're all given zeros, and she said, I'm calling your parents today. I'm sitting there like, I wasn't doing it. She's like, I don't want to hear it. She like, totally thought I was lying. And here's the worst part. None of the other three ever said a word to tell her that I wasn't part of this mess. Now, have I forgiven them? Yes. Do I know their first and last names? You better believe I do. If I see them again, I will show them the grace of Jesus Christ. So, but I was guilty by association because I was in proximity with them. What they were doing became my guilt. Their guilt became mine. What I love about the gospel is the gospel flips this on its head, and it's not guilty by association, it's you become righteous by association. So it's nothing that you did, nothing you were really involved in, but when you are in proximity to Jesus, or as Ephesians puts it, when you are in Christ, you are not guilty by association, you become righteous by association. And so when God looks at you, he's not seeing the mess you're making in your life, he's seeing the righteousness of his son in you. That's what God sees. This is what we're invited into. I love this idea of being in Christ because in short, what this means is that if it's true for Christ, then it's true for me. And that means if Christ is righteous, then I am righteous. And this is what he's bringing us to. And guys, so we cannot and we will not be able to live according to God's standard. And we are not challenged and invited to even attempt to do that. Jesus makes this abundantly clear by, by raising this standard, making us understand that we cannot live to this measure and this standard. But what we can do is we can trust that Christ did and that his righteousness is good enough for me. That's what we can do. Now, I want to give one quick kind of thought and disclaimer. Because this is where some people run with this. Okay, it's not about law, it's about grace. And there's this passage where Paul says, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. So if we're not careful, our conclusion might be, okay, I've been made righteous. I don't have to do anything to get righteous. Just receive it. So I guess I can live however I want because grace. Like, this is awesome. Like, what a great religion to be a part of. I got heaven, and I can just, like, do whatever, whatever I want to do. Now, what I love is Paul writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Like, he knew what you would be thinking. He knew what the, he knew what the Roman church was thinking, and he, and he poses this question that he had already heard, where he says, well, then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we can go on sinning? I love that. And Paul, how he responds, he goes, by no means. He goes, of course not, guys. That's not, that's not what this means. Can I just tell you this? If your perspective is that I can keep on sinning because grace covers me, I, I need you to understand something. That would be reflective of a heart, I believe, that has yet to be truly transformed by Christ. Because out of, out of a relationship with Jesus, it doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. You're going to sin. You're going to fall into temptation. You might have addictions that don't just go away. But the heart begins to shift and transform. So it's not that you look at it and go, okay, well, I'm just going to use grace as my excuse to do whatever I want. Understand this. Grace excuses you of your sins, but it cannot become your excuse to sin. It's your pardon, but it's not your reason to party. You know what I'm saying? I just made that up on the fly. I like the way that sounded. Right? I was like, come on, I'm feeling it. So it, it excuses you of your sin, but it cannot be your excuse to sin. Now, now let, me, let me illustrate it like this. Imagine in my marriage, if my thought, I've been married nine and a half years. Now, imagine if my you know, relationship with my wife and the way that I thought was, okay, I wonder how much I could talk to other women and text and, and you know, call, maybe go on some dates before it's actually considered cheating. I wonder how close I could get to that line. Would that be indicative of a true love and covenant and commitment that we have? Or would that be a guy who got into something that he didn't really know what he was even getting into? 
Right? That's, a, that's a heart that is not captured by my wife. Because I'm looking at, well, what can I get away with? Yeah, this is exactly how so many believers live. What's the line that I can get as close as I can to before it's actually considered sin? When the evidence of a heart that's been transformed by Christ isn't how close can I get, but how close can I get to Jesus and far away from my past and the things that are going to drag me away from him? So it's not about, okay, what's that line? And like, is this, is this me, you know, going over the edge? Is this, is this an affair, you know, on God, if you will? Or do we say, man, my heart is for him. And I know I won't be perfect, but I am in pursuit of my Savior. This is grace. Now, i got to be honest, I almost bypassed this passage to get to the other stuff. Because Jesus talks about anger and murder and lust and adultery and all these great things that we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks. But I felt like before we get to go further in the Sermon on the Mount, we have to have this base foundation of understanding of what does it mean that Jesus came to usher in a new covenant of grace. It is not by works. It is by grace that we are saved. If you guys would stand with me, and if you would grab your communion cup that you got on your way in. I want to end today kind of just with a moment together as a family where we can take communion together. And I think what a great way to end this message. Because... In the Gospels, when Jesus sits down with his disciples at the Last Supper, this was the night he would go to the garden. He would be arrested and he would be crucified in the early morning hours of that night. He fully knew this. He sits down with his disciples at the table and he begins to do something really kind of strange and unexpected. And he takes a, a cup and he pours the wine into it and he says, he says to them, this is my blood which is poured out for you. Now I understand they don't have context for this in the moment. So they're like, what is this guy talking about? But he says, this is my blood that is poured out for you. And it is a symbol and a sign of the new covenant, the new age that I'm going to be bringing about tonight. Then he takes the bread and he breaks it and he shares it, passes it around. He says, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And the Old Testament, it tells us that by his stripes, we are healed. His broken body is the very reason that our physical bodies can still experience healing today. So his blood doesn't just cover our sin, it removes it. And his broken body is what allows us to see God active in our lives, healing our physical bodies. So this is what we do. Jesus said, do this, in, do this often in remembrance of me. He wanted the church to come together, maybe in this kind of a setting, but also you can do this in your homes. You can do this with your husband, your wife, your friends. You can take communion together. But he said, just do this often because I want you to remember how many of you guys know there's power in remembrance? Just taking a moment to, in our busyness of life, like I, I doubt very many of us woke up this morning and just said, thank you for the cross, Jesus. But now that we're here, we get to say, well, let's, let's pause. And let's think about what Christ did on that cross. That we are no longer bound to the law that we cannot live up to, but we are free and we are made righteous through Christ because he who knew no sin became sin for us. This is what we remember in this moment. So I'm going to pray in just a second. The first thing I want to do, we're going to take about maybe 20 seconds, and we're just going to kind of have a, a, a moment of silence, not to like mourn Christ, but for this reason. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, before we take communion, we are to examine ourselves. So what we're going to do just for a second is, is have an internal moment of examination. And what I mean by this is it's a moment of repentance, where if you've got some unrepentant sin in, in your heart, in your mind, your life, where right now you just say, God, I want to bring this to you, and I just ask Jesus that your grace would not only cover this, but, but remove it. So can we just take a second before we take communion in just 20 seconds, close your eyes. Anything that you've not brought to the Lord that would be a sin or an offense to God, however you want to word that, just say, God, I give this to you. And receive his forgiveness and receive his grace. Let's pray over these elements. We'll pray for the cup first. We'll take that together. Or the bread first. And then we'll take the cup second after I pray for that. Heavenly Father, Jesus, thank you for your body that was broken for us. Right now we remember the sacrifice you made physically, the agony that you went through. Thank you, Jesus, for taking the penalty. The wages of sin is death. And 
you stood in our place. And thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes, by your broken body, our bodies can be made well. By your stripes, we are healed. We thank you, Jesus. We're grateful and pray this in your name. Amen. Let's go ahead and take the bread together. Pray, pray over the cup. Jesus, thank you for your blood that was shed. As Peter said, the precious blood of the lamb without blemish. And we receive your sacrifice, not just as a cover of our sin, but as a removal of the penalty of sin. Thank you, Jesus, that through your blood that was shed, we are made righteous before God. That in you, Christ, we are your righteousness. We don't stand condemned or guilty, but we stand innocent and made right before our God. That we can have a promise of eternity in heaven because of you. We acknowledge that, we accept it, and we remember it today. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and take the cup together. Lord, I just ask that you would seal today your word, this foundation of faith, the theology, God. I pray that it would be something that we could build on top of, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for your sermon that we get to study, that it changes us, Lord, that it shapes us, that it molds us. Jesus, help us by your spirit to become more like you, to reflect you in a greater way every single day. Stir in our hearts today. Encourage us, inspire us, challenge us. We love you. We pray this all in your name. Amen.